Today's another episode where I will be learning right alongside of you. When I started cultivating, I thought soil was mostly inert and it was like a computer. Insert NPK and out came cannabis flowers. Over time though, I have been humbled by how little I knew and I'm grateful for all the regenerative cultivation pathfinders who constantly teach me what they have learned so that I can grow better flowers in a way that most honors the earth. So I can be part of the solution and less part of the problem. One thing I have learned again and again is that the soil is its own universe. It is infinitely complex. A truly regenerative cultivator doesn't see the soil as something apart from the earth and separate. A regenerative grower sees the soil in their hands as the earth itself. As regenerative cultivators, we are constantly completing cycles, closing loops, and acting in service to the earth. And that's an important aspect. Being in service to the earth really focuses our attention on how we can help the earth heal from the damage we have done as humans and how to work in partnership with the earth to grow the best damn cannabis possible. If you want to learn about cannabis health, cultivation, and technique efficiently and with good cheer, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. We'll send you new podcast episodes as they come out, delivered right to your inbox, along with commentary on a couple of the most important news items from the week and videos too. Don't rely on social media to let you know when a new episode is published. Sign up for the updates to make sure you don't miss an episode. Also, we are giving away very cool prizes to folks who are signed up to receive the newsletter. This month, our friends at Magical Butter are awarding our winner a fantastic four-pack gummy bundle including a Magical Butter countertop extraction machine, filter press, a decar box, gummy mixes, and gummy molds too. A $432 value. Sign up for the Magical Butter newsletter now at MagicalButter.com. And to win, go to ShapingFire.com to sign up for the newsletter and be entered into this month's and all future newsletter prize drawings. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Los. My guest today is Kawadamak Via. Kawadamak Via is a highly respected and sought-after regenerative soil educator. He is a friend of the microbes, student of their ancient wisdom, and teacher of their ways. He has years of experience working with effective microorganisms and creating custom soil blends specific to the needs of the plants he's working with. He does work in bioremediation of land and waterways and teaches school kids these practices. He also teaches indigenous agricultural practices. Today we're going to talk about biochar. During the first set, we're going to get a good understanding of what biochar is. During the second set, we're going to learn how to make biochar. And in the third set, we learn best practices for using biochar in your garden of any size. Welcome to the show, Kawatamuk. Thank you, Shingolos. So let's get right into it. We've all probably seen biochar and seen folks making biochar, but let's all start with a basic understanding of what biochar actually is. When we take wood and burn it in hopes of making biochar, what is it exactly that we're hoping to make? Well, what we're trying to do is we're hoping to create and leave behind just the carbon structure of the biomass uh, that we're uh, burning. And by doing that, by just keeping the skeleton, the carbon of the, of the, uh, of the biomass, this is going to then contribute so many benefits to the biology of the soil. As we consider life, we consider things need water, but we also must consider how important carbon is as well. And that's what we're going to have when we're made good biochar is a good high percentage of carbon um, remaining from the burn. I like that idea that um, we're trying to get ourselves down to the skeleton, how you put that. We're kind of like burning off the fat. Um, <clears throat> what are the aspects of the wood that we're trying to remove so that we can get to the carbon core? We're going we're, we're gonna, to um, burn off all of the volatile gases from the biomass. And these volatile gases is what's going to contribute to the fire. But as the heat pressure increases, as this heat pressure is then going to extract or, if you can imagine, squeeze out the volatile gases from the biomass in hopes of just leaving us those skeletal remains, the carbon. So in a way, we are kind of refining carbon in a way. We're, we're taking this uh, beginning material of wood and we're, we're getting rid of everything that we don't necessarily want to use as a fertilizer and purifying it into um, 
I guess, a specialty carbon. Exactly. And um, within the structure of that carbon, it's going to be formed into a shape which is very similar to a beehive. And that honeycomb structure is then going to be home for many beneficial microorganisms, nematodes, water, nutrients. But I think most of all we got to remember is these bones or these carbon remains also have electrical information about that plant in which it grew in. And this becomes a major contributing factor in the regenerating growth of the new successors of that plant. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring us back to the electrical information in a minute. I want to start with uh, your first point there on um, on honeycomb, the honeycomb structure. So um, <clears throat> this may be a, too vague of a question, but I'm gonna give it a shot anyway. Um, is there any explanation for why when we burn wood, we're left with the honeycomb? I mean, it's such a it's such a unique shape and it's so detailed. Um, do we know why after we burn? burn it, it looks like that? Yeah, it's the pattern and the energy in which drove the force of that plant to transport water and nutrients up and down. So, you know, I call it skeletal remains, but it can also be looked at as veins. But it's the pattern and structure of that particular um, uh, plant or tree. And this is this becomes very important because each structure within each plant and tree is going to be created differently. And it's in the diversity of those structures which allow a, a many different kinds of microorganisms to then call that carbon home. So each unique structure will foster a unique set of life form. All right, that's that, that's totally cool. I was not expecting that badass answer. All right, let, let's let's dig into that a little bit. So first of all, um, I really like the idea that um, it is showing the the vein structure. Uh, of the plant because it, you know, this is to my fault. As I learn about plant biology, I learn more and more that that my my understanding that it's kind of uniform within the plant, and there's just you know um, the flesh of the plant, and then the outside is just a real misunderstanding of what's going on in the interior botany of the plant. And I don't think I've ever thought about that until now because I've I've seen what biochar looks like up close, and it is. So so detailed and and you know you've got you've got pits here and elongated bits there and 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 if you're telling me that that the burning reveals the guts of the plant this is telling me that the inside of the living plant is far far more complex than i am imagining as a cultivator a hundred percent we're just scratching the surface on this thing you know we've looked at the plant in so many different ways but now as we're looking at the electrical influences that shape the plant and we get into this fourth phase water we realize how electric these things are and anything electric is going to need conductivity and just like we see mycelium growing differently and threading differently these patterns in nature they repeat themselves because they work so we're finding these patterns and how they relate to not just mycelium or plant growth but your own human body, there's so many patterns within everything that it's just become so, ex and this is what makes the work so exciting because I'm just a farmer. I'm not a scientist, never have been, but the excitement of watching patterns and shapes, you can see the relations and how they all come together. Mm -hmm. So let, let's <clears throat> let's let's tie into the electrical info because now you've hit on it twice. And I got to admit, like... I. I, I've got to know that there is our electrical impulses in plants as there are through all of nature, but to hear you talk so quickly about the uh, the electrical info or the electrical history of the plant, I, I must admit, I don't exactly even know what you mean by that. So, so break that out a little bit for us. Okay, so if we think of like a forest and how that grows and how important the fire is to that forest to continue to grow and stay healthy so it's not overran with invasives we can see where that fire as it comes through and burns and leaves behind its skeletal structure that that new plant that grows the new seed that grows is always stronger than the original plant now 
when we think of storing information in carbon, this is nothing new. All of our phones and computers all use carbon that we call silica. And the basis of loading information onto the silica so we can access it when we need information, we can just whip our phones out and get it. We've never contributed or related that to the forest itself. When we leave behind the carbon structure of the parent, grandparent plants that have burned and their carbon is in the soil, their successors can do the same thing. They can tap into that carbon. They can know the relationships their parents and grandparents had, meaning trees, and how those symbiotic relationships worked because it's in the carbon structure of the char. And this is what makes the forest so intelligent and evolves the way that it does because it stores information. And even now we realize there's microorganisms, these electron microbes that can join together, create a force that can influence a lightning strike into an area. You can see where the force fire is not random, but more of a specific, we need to create memory here. The microbes somehow decide, influence a lightning strike to carbonize because this is how the planet has done it for so long. So these patterns are nothing new. They've always have happened. We mimic them as we develop computers and software. Even as we talk biochar, we would have, we're used to doing this with farmers and conservationists and groups like that. But now we're getting the semiconductor industry in the workshops because they're looking for other carbon sources besides silica to create computers. And things like cannabis and hemp are testing at 200% more semiconductor potential than other materials. This is why we're now seeing the computer guys at the workshops asking questions about the electrical side of things where the sky's the limit with carbon and we're just scratching the surface. <clears throat> the idea that biochar could be you know, a natural hard drive for nature is like, you know, truly mind blowing. Right. Um, so it, how literally should we take this idea? Let's say that we've got a Hugo culture and we're throwing biochar in it and then we're growing our cannabis plants on top and the roots are going down and they come in contact with the biochar. And up until our conversation, I've been just imagining that moment is about two things. It's about the nutrition fertilization for my plant coming in contact with the biochar because it loves that um, um, that pyrogenic carbon. Um, but but then and then also it is touching the bio the, the roots of my cannabis plant are touching the biochar which is a home of microbes and so it's providing them a variety of shelter too so that's cool but but now you've added something else which is this this carbon from the now deceased and biocharred plant that there are at a very simplistic level, data points that are stored in this carbon. If we want to get a little more poetic about it, maybe it's like the story of the tree that is being passed on to my cannabis plant. Like, 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 I guess I don't even know what I'm asking here. How literally should we take this fact that there's information going from the tree to my cannabis plant? Okay, so we know that plants communicate through terpenes. And when the plants have more information, when they have learned a gr great deal of information from being under the stars, growing under the sun, being in contact with carbon, that information then transfers into what we know as terpenes. Now, when we test cannabis that's grown, and this is what I love about the legal industry now, we, us as the old farmers, everyone, we always knew we had flavorful herb, but now we're to have the terpene test. And we can see those terpenes are getting higher and higher with the more carbon or more information we're able to work with that plant. And this is what makes it so exciting. And when we send this stuff into extract, where typically the capture of the oils under normal organic farming, they were about 4% of the capturing uh, oil out of biomass and extraction. We've got the number up to 7%. There's way more information or what the bosses say, oil. There's way more oil now in the flower. And then aside from that, we have doubled and tripled the terpene scores, which for me, that's the most important number I'm looking at because then that is telling me that 
we are working with the plant closely together and that plant is going to have more information to then share with the human who's going to consume it. And that's why when we smoke the good herb with the good flavor, you're going to ask yourself, who grew this? Where did it grow? If you don't know the name, you want to know the name of it and the parent of that plant. So when we are growing cannabis, we've taken cannabis from a, it's, it, you know, from a very, um, money driven industry but there's cultures where this is exactly how the cannabis plant was raised the more the cultivator grows and becomes a better person as they work with the plant the plant knows the intention and that information or what we call terpenes is starting to increase and this is why special growers not just with cannabis whether you're doing farm food or grapes wine there's certain things where you can do the same inputs, but if the heart of the farmer is not in the position of continuing to want to grow and make and improve himself, then that information becomes limited. So the ultimate goal when we grow these plants is really about how we can become better humans, but then at the same time, the information in which those are going to, people are going to consume those plants, you have got to hope that that's the same thing that's going to happen when they take on the information. So for me, information is translates and in, into terpenes and into more oil. So there's a close relation. We just have somehow missed the mark because we get, I mean, when you're doubling your oil production, they start counting the stacks of cash. They're not thinking about what we just talked about. But me who always wants to improve myself, I realize, man, that is, can only be done with a close relationship to the plant to the soil and to the people who are going to consume that plant, envisioning who they are and carrying that with you as you work out there in the field. That's it, the information the plant needs. It's also an indictment of large scale automated growing too, because the more large, the more you scale and the more you automate, the less the interaction less interaction the farmer has with the plant and you know it's no joke that highly automated commercial flour is going to have lower terpene profiles than yes. than slower than than smaller scale deeply loved plants and um you know and and and, and your argument is that you know if the farmer's not involved and the terpenes uh, percentages are lower, um, it is very true that the, the cultivator is communicating less with the actual toker. And that's a really interesting idea. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> yeah, those are the kind of things where as we strive to grow the best, we have to realize we're also trying to grow our best self. And mm. it's so closely related to how those things go hand in hand. Right on. So, so let's talk about this specialty carbon that we are um, uh, that we're trying to refine out of the wood. So, so um, you know they call it pyrogenic carbon, of course. But, but why why is this carbon so uh, effective and so uh, well? Hell, it's also expensive, right? If you buy it, what's so special about pyrogenic carbon compared to other carbon sources that we could feed our plants? Um, so what we're going to look at is how the carbon is going to react within the soil. And there's so many soil types people have around the country. Some people, you know, they use a lot of water. Some don't. It just seems like the carbon is, allows for that forgiving factor. And let's be real. When people are learning to grow or they're trying to increase something, uh, terpenes or something, they always want to use more of the formula. So I'm finding like with the biochar, it has such a forgiveness factor on not only the water that we're using, the ingredients that we're using, but when we want to go too much, it, it, it seems to be a buffer and, and keep our pH in, in a range that's going to be favorable for the plant. Um, and then that being said, when our plants are growing, we don't realize our soil is like a battery. And if we're draining from the battery, it's going to have less and less energy to supply the plant, especially as the plant develops and grows bigger. Um, so the char allows for the energy to be kept up in the soil, but also calculating as the plant gets bigger, all of the sunlight hitting the leaves are making sugars pump out of the roots. What's happening? Are you calculating all those sugar productions or are you just calculating your drops? 
when it comes to soil health. So when I have the biochar and I'm getting the sugar production, that's exactly what I want when it comes to growing microbes. So it seems to just allow the microorganism development to thrive much more efficiently. I mean, with permanent housing, come on, who, who wouldn't thrive? You know, hard, it has hard permanent housing, it has water, it has food, electricity. That's everything you need to live. So these are the kind of things that we have to consider when we're developing soil. In, in your description of it, it sounds like pyrogenic carbon is kind of like a, a, uh, a flexible, knowing, athletic carbon, like good for any soil in the country, can change and mold itself to what you need it to be. It sounds like it's, it's kind of like a, um, you know, super carbon, you know, or something. It's, 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 the, it's, a, it's a carbon goal that is just going to simply outperform our other usual sources. Definitely. And you mentioned the cost, you know, the cost is like super high right now. But what fascinates me is the USDA just came off of a program where they're giving away char free. Every oh, farmer oh. in the country. I was talking about this the whole time. We got very little cannabis people to sign up, but tons of hazelnut farmers. But here's what's happening. The um, USDA is understanding how we're developing food with no carbon. It's like making houses without a building code. So by them supplying the carbon free to the farmers, they're going to be able to continue to collect data. And then they're going to send out portable um, biochar units so that the farms can collect bio their own biomass and convert on site. So my point is the agencies now are seeing the value of char and trying to get it in the hands of people now. So now it's up to the people to do their homework to figure out, okay, is were they just talking this good thing to sell us biochar or is it something good for the soil? So when I see the USDA now getting involved, I mean, if you're doing something other than cannabis, you know about the the food production issues we have for the for for our areas especially low income areas this is why they're trying to get charred everybody so we can have sustainable food so it's just not for driving your cannabis up to a certain level but it's really about developing soil for long term investment and we have major players now giving it to people free well, wow. right on. <clears throat> it's too bad that um, that uh, we didn't have this conversation before the USDA biochar program was completed because this would have been a great plug to, to get more cannabis people involved. <laughs> Hopefully they'll do it again. Yeah, and Shango, for sure, When um, next time it, it happens, I'll contact you as soon as I get the info so we can continue to support um, community use. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to support farming. I would love to support <clears throat> that message. Okay, so let's let's circle back around to the advantages of the biochar now that we've got a better idea of, you know, what it physically is. So, um, uh, when people ask you what the advantages to their cannabis plant is, what do you tell them? It's going to improve the immune system of that plant, which then is going to help fight off a lot of diseases and pests. So, I mean, it's just like a healthy person. So I'm always trying to encourage them that by having a healthy plant, you're going to be able to avoid many things um, down the road that cause failure in our crops. So it's um, it's not yeah. that the biochar itself is necessarily changing the plant. It's that the biochar is, you know, providing homes for the microbes so that there's a buffet of nutrition in the soil and that it is uh, good at holding water and so the plant is less likely to dry out and the and the and the um uh, rhizosphere is less likely to have the microbes cyst up. It's it's a, it, it's it kind of essentially a soil regulator, and it's through that regulation that the plant is going to have better color and better structure and better pest resistance. Yes, but also keep it in mind, like each cannabis plant is going to have specific microbes that they're partnering with. We you know we call them the endophytes now, mm -hmm. and if we don't make a home for these microbes to go in and out of the plant and keep going through the loop then that's really what is going to drive that the healthy soil and the healthy plant is fostering the microbes in which that plant really wants to partner with and you know we can drop in inputs from 
all kinds of uh, beautiful creations. But essentially what I'm thinking is the plant does want to partner with a lot of the beautiful natural farming drops we're doing, but it also has like a special group of partners it already has in, inside of it. It carried from seed and uh, allowing for those little guys to continue to live, whether in the plant or out of the plant in my char. Uh, no, it'll just uh, no, I know that I have the A team for each plant because each plant has their own different one. I have the A team supported. And that gives me a way better chance of success. Right on. All right. So um, uh, before we go to break, I, w- I would like to t- hit on the water retention. Um, we've already mentioned it a couple of times, but um, a lot of people I know, this is the first reason why they go to biochar because, you know, many of us, especially container farmers, right? A little less so folks who are directly in the ground, but definitely for container farmers, we do this, um, this whiplash thing where, um, the, 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 the container goes from too dry and the microbes are cysting up and the soil is getting hydrophobic to suddenly we're trying to make up for it and we are um, making the soil too wet then and then so now it's too wet and it's waterlogged and we're we're um um, we're choking everything out from oxygen and then we let that dry out. And then, then, Oh my gosh. Then, then in a couple of weeks we were too dry again. And the, the swinging back and forth, we keep on hampering our microbes and people say, well, that hasn't happened since I've, I've, I've started using biochar. So, so talk to us a little bit about the water retentive capabilities and water equalizing abilities of biochar. Yeah, so in a lot of applications where we're using the biochar, and this is anywhere between 5 to 15%, we're able to cut that water down in half. And it, just like you mentioned, the way the water um, enters into the soil or, or pot and then respires back out, it's all, it makes all the difference on how that plant grows. But with the char, since all that little, those little pieces are holding water, it's distributed back to the system, seems to be much, much slower and it's just much better for the plant. And we've, we've seen um, some operations that were doing about two gallons a day on full-grown plants. Do fine and even better after char was applied at um, one gallon per day. And this is mixed into the rows. Or if they did another, another section they did, they just dug out maybe about 10 gallons of soil, mixed the char into there, and then put it back into the hole and planted the cannabis plant. And you couldn't tell the difference physically from the plants where the char was tilled in or the plants where the char was just put into the hole. They physically looked the same and same amount of water. The only difference was when they went to lab, the um, char with the, the rows with the char in the row scored higher, Mm. but um, plants still physically looked really good from, from the lesser amount of char. Right on. So, so if um, it makes your water go further and it holds your water longer, and it, um, it it's almost like um, over time, it's it, it gives the soil its own slow drip of water instead of a flood. Definitely. And then when you think of like below all that, where all the all the water's leaching down into, when you have um, the micronized char headed further down into the soil system it it starts to aggregate the soil differently the biofilms are different and all of these contribute to water holding capacities when you have these um things going for you that micronized biochar is probably at the core of why biochar regenerates uh abused and old soil right yeah it's one of my favorites they they have (laughs) yeah because you can also put those in drip lines they don't clog up it's so micronized yeah oh wow and yeah and it just keeps sinking deeper and deeper through the soil um it's definitely more costly to use that very fine activated they have even activated carbon style but the results are so quick and they can integrate into many systems whether you're doing hydroponic or or to or soil so these are always like the one quick shot. If they allow me to do anything to their system, I'll pump into some very fine micronized char and the electrical charge back to their soil always translates into plants praying 
that then that's where you get more and more work. When people see their plants lift, that's when they become more receptive. And it doesn't take long when you add them to the char. There is just something about the healthy glow of a, of a praying cannabis plant to make you believe in the strategy you're using, isn't there? It's just, it, I, think, I think it makes every cultivator glow with pride. No, that's really how we know, right? I mean, when you come to work the next day after a drop and they're doing that, I call it plant yoga. <laughs> no, because the cells are just so hydrated. They're reaching. You can just, it looks like they're stretching. It's a yoga. And it's nothing better than to come to work in the morning and see them doing that. Hell yeah, that's beautiful. All right, so we're going to take our first of two short breaks and be right back. When we come back uh, in set two, we're going to talk about um, uh, choosing wood for making biochar and how to make biochar and uh, and some best practices. Uh, you are listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is Kwatamuk Via. Without these advertisers, Shaping Fire would not happen. So please support them and let them know you heard them on Shaping Fire. For years, organic cultivators have been looking for a peat moss replacement. Peat moss has long been the go-to soil amendment for water retention and container growing, but organic growers are recognizing now that peat moss is an unsustainable resource, and the mining of peat bogs destroys wetland habitats and releases sequestered carbon. But peat moss works so well that many have continued to use it. Now there is finally a revolutionary replacement for peat moss that provides better benefits while being a sustainable choice. Pit moss sounds and acts like peat moss, but instead of being mined from fragile ecosystems, is actually made from upcycled organic paper and cardboard headed for landfills. Pit moss is excellent at retaining water in your substrate and creating air pockets and tiny living environments for microbes. Pit moss instantly increases aeration, nutrient absorption, and water conservation too. Carefully and locally sourced, pit moss is the result of decades-long research into the use of recycled paper fibers. Pit moss is lightweight and easy to use, and pit moss is inert so it won't change your pH. Available in a range of preparations including a nutrient-enhanced blend and an organic soil conditioner with no added nutrients. Pit moss is also available as an animal bedding for horses, chickens, and small animals. You can save 15% with the discount code SHAPINGFIRE, one word, no caps, when shopping on pitmoss.com. So go to pitmoss.com now to learn more. That's P-I-T-T-M-O-S-S dot com. Growing healthier, stronger, more sustainable plants. Pit moss. There are so many seed banks nowadays that you really have options in who to choose. Not only that, if you pick the wrong seed bank, you could be in for a really sketchy ride. And that's only one of the reasons I recommend Hembra Genetics Collection to my friends and listeners who are looking for a seed bank. That's Hembra, spelled H-E-M-B-R-A. Hembra is not just another seed bank. Hembra is a woman-operated boutique cannabis genetics provider that only sells thoughtfully curated seeds from the top names in cannabis breeding. With over 50 breeders and over 500 strains to choose from, you will certainly find something you'll love. Hembra Genetics has something for everyone with over 350 feminized strains, 200 regular varieties, and over 100 autoflowers to choose from. Names you know you can trust, like Humboldt Seed Company, Night Owl, Canarado, In-House Genetics, Fast Buds, and Gnome Automatics. We both know that there are other seed banks who will take your money, but have no customer service. I invited Hembra to advertise on Shaping Fire after hearing so many good stories about them from my friends. They have A-plus customer service with lightning-fast response times. In most cases, Helene and Caitlin will get your order out the same day you place it, and you'll usually receive your seeds in just a few days. Most seed banks are simply not this organized or interested in getting your seeds to you this fast. But Hembra cares. You even get free seeds with every order. Helene and Caitlin get it. They have been in the cannabis growing scene for over a decade. So save a few bucks by using this discount code too. Use the code SHAPINGFIRE, all one word, at checkout to save 10% off your order. Buy seeds from good folks who will get you great seeds reliably every time. Visit hembragenetics.com today. That's Hembra Genetics. 
As cannabis regulations become more demanding and consumers become more educated, it is increasingly important to avoid the use of chemical pesticides when cultivating cannabis. Beneficial insects have been used for decades by the greenhouse vegetable and ornamental plant industry, and today many cannabis cultivators are moving from sprays and chemicals to beneficial insects. Copert has the beneficial insects, mites, and nematodes, microbials, sticky cards, and air distribution units you need to partner with nature to defend your garden. Whether you manage acres of canopy or have a simple grow tent in your home, Copert is ready to help answer your questions and help you transition away from chemical sprays towards clean and natural solutions. Since 1967, Copert has assisted growers in identifying pests and devising reliable solutions while providing healthy insects and mites that will protect your yield. Since the 1990s, Copert has been a leader in cannabis pest and disease control worldwide and have highly trained consultants to assist you in Canada and the United States from coast to coast. With their global network of grower support, Copert can help. Visit copert.com, choose your country, and get detailed information. That's copert, K-O-P-P-E-R-T dot com. For the most up-to-date cannabis-related biological control information, you can also check their Instagram at Copert Canada. You know getting away from pesticides is good for health and good for business, and Copert is ready to help. Visit copert.com today. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I am your host, Shago Los, and my guest today is Quadamuk Villa. So before the break, we were talking about what exactly biochar was and the advantages to the plant, to the rhizosphere uh, in the soil, and you know, pretty much the the, the, the earth itself, and certainly the now uh, uh, microbes having homes are definitely stoked too. But um, this set, we're going to talk more about actually how to make biochar because as we talked about in the first set if you're gonna buy biochar um, it's actually quite expensive and um, it's really not that hard to make and and like many things in our cultivation scene um, you know it, being, you know, it's time or money, right? You can save a lot of money if you make your own ferments instead of buying your own fertilizers. And in the same way, if you've got enough time, um, if you make your own biochar, you can have a super powerful ally to your cultivation without actually having to pay your hard-earned money for it. So, so let's start by talking about what kind of wood we should use. Now, during the first set, you said that, um, you know, these different types of woods, uh, they have got uh, different um, botanical um, setups inside of the plant, inside of the tree, inside of the shrub, whatever we're going to make the biochar out of. And those provide different types of homes for different microbes. So that's great. But I, I would believe that, you know, over the years, you have tried to make biochar out of lots of different types of wood. And, and you've got to have some of your favorites and for good reasons. So, so talk to us about what you think through when you're choosing the wood you're going to use for a biochar chair burn okay so as i mentioned before one of my favorite personal plants it's the cannabis and hemp plant um first of all because in our industry nobody does anything with the stems and being that they're 200 percent more conductive than other chars that just allows for more more electricity in my soil and um i get to close the loop too in our industry by bringing that in into uh like we're doing i got a veggie farm here at the island where i live i'll grab the cannabis stocks from the producers on the island and then bring them to the veggie farm over at topaz farm where we'll use it to grow vegetables mm. but uh my second favorite would be blackberry blackberry if you think of the inside pulpy material inside of that blackberry mm -hmm. when it chars all of that pulp turns into this beautiful crystallization that is easily micronized at that point. And who doesn't have a lot of blackberry up here in the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that one's been super cool. But I love doing like the hardwoods too. Any of the hardwoods are going to just get so hot and burn at a temperature where you're just going to be able to add in other materials to that because the hardwoods are burning so hot. I can maybe add in other kinds of wood I'm maybe not too crazy about. But because of the high heat, it's going to give me a different 
matrix of a honeycomb structure. And that's what really excites me, um, is the, the matrix of the honeycomb. But really, it's, I love to see what people bring. We opened up at our farm for the community just to drop off their biomass, just so we can convert as much as possible. And I was finding like the, the apple uh, prunings just made an amazing char as well. So it's a whole discovery. Um, I learned off of grapevines. Those were the first conversion piles that we did out in Napa. And when they would rotate the vineyards, they usually would take them to the dumps. But we started turning them into biochar. And just incredible, incredible char coming from the grapevines. I got to admit, I'm really surprised that you are are talking about, let alone preferring what I think of as soft plants like um, like the cannabis and hemp stalks and the blackberry versus hardwoods. I really thought that that the answer to the question was you were just going to tell me a varieties of of trees that you liked. Um, I'm really surprised that and and we'll we'll talk more in detail about how you know like how to manage the biochar burn in a couple minutes, but. I'm I'm really surprised that that those soft fleshed plants can be used at all um, because they're so soft. I would assume that they would just like burn right up. Yeah, but let's think for a minute, Shingo. If we're doing some cannabis breeding and I'm working with this plant, trying to look for a specific trait, the plant knows what I'm looking for. Maybe it couldn't get there on that on that journey, but the seeds that come out of it. If I don't put those skeletons of that plant back into the soil, it, it just seems like it would take longer to achieve the characteristics in which I'm looking for. So by adding the bones in of the, the last breeding cycles, I think shortens the duration of what you're looking for because the information then can get passed to the new seed where its parent information can to say, hey, you know that farmer that's growing us? He's looking for these specific terpenes. If by chance you could grow them, let's, let's increase that. And this is the strange way of the cannabis plant, but you can see where if there's any legs to it at all, you can really quicken and improve and become more targeted in the cannabinoid um, research you're doing by adding in the old plants. So that's why I like to use not only my own cannabis that I've worked with, but cannabis from other farms too. Because it essentially is cannabis, and it's going to be talking to the new cannabis. Just something I think is special about that relation. Well, yeah, definitely something special. And I gotta, I gotta tell you, you know, I, I wouldn't, nece- I don't necessarily consider myself especially spiritual. I mean, I, I meditate and all, but, but compared to the kind of ideas that that you're laying out. Uh, you know, these are these are mostly new to me. I say um, humbly, um, this idea that you are bringing forth that um, the if the plants are holders of data and stories and and how to repair the soil, and if when we burn them into biochar, it is. Um, refining the carbon down to its basics and that carbon is holding memory just like carbon silica holds memory in our iPhones and if this is you know feeding the memories back into the earth it really creates a whole different motivation and intention for all of us as humans to take all of our natural waste, our, our organic waste, and turn it all in the biochar and put it back into the earth because like duh, why wouldn't we? And you know that that whole that whole package of idea right there is all brand new to me. Yeah, and I kind of like to picture it as, you know, we have computer programmers, right? And they are loading software on computer to run specific apps. If you think about what you're doing when you're making char, you're a nature programmer. And that char can be in the soil for hundreds, thousands of years. It can have that information. And we'll get into it a little bit later, but there's other ways you can load information onto the char too where the reality of you are really a co-creator in programming nature, 
becomes a reality. You can create the char specifically from the good, healthy blocks of the vineyard that you have, then create char with that information that you can put into the less healthier blocks and continue to co-create and regenerate soil that way. Right on. That's awesome. All right. So, um, so we've talked about um, your favorite types of wood and why we want to use different types of woods because they make different types of housing structures and then they carry different kinds of information. Um, how about the worst to use? Are there any are there any types of woods that you have come across where you're like, okay, most all of them are great, but this one is really not going to get you where you want to go. Is there any wood that we should avoid? No, but you do want to avoid using wet wood. You can buy a moisture meter. I think they're about $40. You want to use wood that's between a 15 and 22% moisture. Any biomass within that range, it's going to combust beautifully. The only problem you'll have is when you're using wood that's wet. That'll you make a lot of smoke. The temperature may not go up. And making biochar in the Pacific Northwest, because we it rains so much, this is very important because you don't want to make char and create a bunch of smoke. If char is made correctly, you can use that smoke to drive the combustion. So moisture meter will it'll keep you from, all wood is good, you just gotta make sure it's dry. All right, so for, for all of us cultivators who cut corners, um, I happen to be one often, unfortunately, um, and we don't have moisture meters. Clearly, a freshly cut tree is going to have the highest percentage of moisture, whatever that may be. Um, I do have a fireplace, though, right? And so I am very used to the idea of taking down a tree and bucking it and then putting it in piles and then it'll be good the next year. Can you give us like like I don't know, just like a a rule of thumb or some guesses for us about how long after we take down a tree before it would be good for um, for making biochar is I mean should, is is it the same strategy as as ma you know making effective firewood or or is it faster than that? Yeah, so if we had our trees stacked from our cuttings from the spring, they should be dry enough to burn in the fall. Okay. Um, a lot of times, too, if we make the piles but throw a tarp on the top, they'll release enough water so we can burn. Like if I cut piles in the fall but threw a tarp on them, by springtime, they wouldn't have taken in all the rainwater and released their water. It'd be good to use. But there's always a chance where if I wanted to do a burn and I had some material that was kind of wet, but if I had... Three quarters uh, percent of that pile was really dry. You could integrate and mix the two and get a full combustion from, from the material. All right. So all right. there's certain little tricks you can do sometimes mixing really dry with wetter material or how you stack it or even with some of the kiln technologies where you can use stuff a little bit wetter. But typically if it snaps, you know, the, the rounds that snap, you're good to go. All right. There needs to be a... Uh some kind of a, a a saying there. If it snaps, it caps, or if it snaps, it you know <laughs> something to make a bumper sticker out of. Um, so uh, um, I'm assuming that there's probably a good conversation to be had right here about moving wood. You know how um, they say don't move firewood from one part of your state to the other because you're moving all sorts of um, uh, insects or, or non-indigenous bugs that you might be helping spread around your state. Um, I'm guessing that's probably the same when you're making biochar. I can imagine people collecting wood at place A and then moving it to place B to turn into biochar where it's more convenient for them. Um, we probably shouldn't do that, should we? Yeah, there's times where that can be uh, very dangerous ecological-wise. Um, but, I mean, there's times where some biomass can be moved. You have to look at how it's collected, where it's stacked. You know, try not to put, like, a blanket rule on this thing. Where we have to sequester carbon. We have, there's, that's a fact. And so we have to figure out... A, the materials that we can and cannot use. And there's methods where we can employ that convert the biomass right on site. So there's many ways we can get the conversion done 
but maybe not just with one particular tool. Mm -hmm. So all of us who are natural farmers are very much into IMO, um, indigenous microorganisms, the microorganisms that are in your locale, in your neighborhood. They're your neighbors. And so let's do what we can to beef them up and use them in your local gardening. And I can imagine that same kind of idea might go for uh, the the trees and other plants that we use to make biochar, where if, if, if we're saying like you did in the first set that our trees are holding, you know, memories, if you will, of how to beat a particular pest that it beat several years ago. And, you know, it's still cellular knowledge for the plant um, that that it might make sense to focus on making biochar with the kinds of plants and even source them locally because locally sourced plants are going to provide a biochar that has got memory of your area. What do you think of that? No, that's what, that's the direction it's going. All mm. the conservation agencies now are employing the prescription burns that they call them. Um, forestry groups that are doing in place conversions. This is exactly why, because you can't import those goodies. They're, created on site and must be left on site that, that um it's happening 100 percent. all right cool all right so let's start let's start going through um a process of uh making uh biochar now i've seen biochar I'm, i mean there may be many ways but i've only seen two i've seen people who dig a hole in the ground um that's pretty deep and has got pretty steep sides and they throw everything inside of that and they burn it. And then I see people who are using, um, like, uh, what do you call those things? Like, um, the metal, drum? metal things that are round, um, the kilns. Sure. Kilns, kilns, kilns drums, kil- yeah. drums. That's what I was looking for. Kil- kilns is a pretty sexy name. I just meant like, <laughs> I just meant like, like oil drum looking things. So, uh, so, so what, what are, what, which do you prefer and does it matter? Okay, when it comes to making char, most people on farms are just doing burn piles, you know, and they're burning their waste. So what we try to encourage them to do, instead of just burning their waste, if they employed a different burn technique to their traditional burn piles, they can be left with char. The method in which we're teaching them is referred to as the conservation method. The conservation method is simply when you light that pile of biomass and these biomass, you have to check your, your local regulations for maximum pile size. But what you're going to do instead of lighting, throwing a bunch of gas and lighting that pile on fire, what you want to do is towards the top, you want to put smaller material and create a type of a bird's nest, if you will. Bird's nest where it, when you light that fire, if you light it from the top at that bird's nest, when that little bird's nest starts to burn and combust, it's going to excite the biomass just below it. And the, as it heats up and, and, and excites that biomass, the gases are going to come out of the wood and fuel that little light on top. Now, as that little light on top is burning, its smoke is going to, you'll notice smoke start going into the top of that top lit fire. Smoke is actually um, combustible. And we don't realize that when we make our fires, but by lighting at the top and allowing the smoke to come back into the flame, it's going to drive that top fire even hotter. So the more smoke that's coming out, it's actually the fuel for that fire at the top. And this is what's so cool about it is because you don't no longer have those particulates going up into the air, but coming into the flame front for combustion, you could reduce the particulates from these burn piles where you've seen them at the farm smoking out all the neighborhood. But if that smoke is going into the flame front, driving the combustion, that top lit fire is going to get bigger and bigger and heat that pile up so that the volatile gases get released from the fire kill and, and, and combusting all the smoke. This is where the practice of the art comes in of a conservation burn. As that fire burns that pile down, you're going to notice the white little ash on the top of the material. That's the part where you want to ex- extinguish the fire so that 
you don't turn the carbon into ash. The ash is basically oxidized carbon, but you do want to get the gases out. So learning when to pull the trigger on that fire takes some practice. There's a ton of really cool videos on YouTube where people are using conservation burn with different size piles and materials, but you'll be able to notice when they cool that fire down. And this is the part where the natural farmers, you guys are going to love because when that fire carbon is in flux and in heat, it basically has a memory that's neutralized and is pretty much waiting to receive new information. The hotter I drive the carbon, the more I erase the old memory from that. Now you say, well, you said V has a lot of good memory. Why do you want to erase it? Well, this case, there are times where I want to erase some memory from carbon to load it up with new memory. And the new memory is essentially all of the great ferments that I've been creating. And these ferments can be from your healthiest plants, or like I mentioned, your healthiest parts of the soil. If you can record that information of healthy soil in a liquid tea form added to your water at the cooling process, you're going to then add more memory to that carbon. And this is where you get even more exciting because you are essentially programming the carbon. Now, when they discovered the Terra Preta pits, which means um, black earth, the biochar pits in 1960, um, Cornell University went down to the Amazon to look at these carbon pits that were 10 to 15 feet of biochar, but alongside them were Japanese scientists. And the Japanese scientists did tests on the biochar that is still in America we don't do. And they not only looked at its um, physical properties, but they're very interested in its electromagnetic properties. And in particular, its potential to cast out what we know as far infrared. Far infrared has the ability to have microorganisms self-divide. We know that as mitosis. It's a type of a, of a thermal type of a heat, but at the same time, it's also a, a vibration. It's like hearing your favorite songs while you're working. Mm. And this just gets the microbes cooking and going. But when the Japanese scientists left the, Amaz left the Amazon in the 1960s, they came back and they started playing with what we know today as bioceramics. And these are simply ceramics, silica quartz, like the quartz crystal that you, you got sitting around your house or, you know, quartz crystal to grind those down and fire them at 2000 degrees to erase the memory, but then cool it. They'll cool it with the EM effective microbes and they create this amazing bioceramic. So Japan has been playing with many forms of bioceramic, whether they're mineral influenced or in Dr. Higa's case with EM microbial influence, but their physical ability to cast electromagnetic frequency in the far infrared at about 12 to 15 inches away from the bag lets you know like we are we know nothing about uh there's so much more to learn so when we create our car our, our carbon and our biochar and we keep in mind that the principles that adding in these high power microbial t's are then going to create a physical and an electromagnetic property to the char i hope a grad student will pick up on testing different electromagnetic potentials of char created under different um imo recipes and different consortias that could potentially increase the regeneration capacity of soil. All right. So much in what you just said. So I'm going to go all the way back to the conservation pile, but I want to tell folks that anybody who was just turned on by this idea of bioceramics, um, I, uh, I had the opportunity of hearing Kawadama talk about um, bioceramics uh, in the past, and it, it sounded unreasonable to me. And so I looked it up, and the stuff really exists, and it is very effective. And some of the trials that they have done, just putting bioceramics near other products that you know, improved their like improved taste of wine and things like this is like truly amazing. You know, oh, so we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna go down that path today. But um, it is it is an amazing truth that that you might want to Google bioceramics. So with that said, let's let's go all the way back to the conservation piles. And um, uh, I found it interesting that what you know we're gonna take our burn pile and we're actually really going to just make a a small fire at the top of the burn pile. 
pile instead of just like torching the hell out of the entire burn pile at the same time because what we want to do is create this physical nature of the pile where the fire at the top is going to be pulling oxygen up through the um, burn pile and so it's going to be creating heat and hot more and more heat in the burn pile but really burning from the top so so really the burn pile itself becomes a fuel source for this smaller fire that's at the top and and then you said well that you know it when you're done that's also where you are going to extinguish your fire before it turns to ash uh, with water so that you're left with the biochar instead of just you know powdered ash and 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 then you said take a look on YouTube for videos so that you can get a visual representation of what we want the biochar pile to look like when we put it out. Like, like at what point do we put it out? Now, now that is probably really good advice to turn people to YouTube to, to learn that what that looks like. But if you had to describe it to us without the video, what would you tell us to look for to to know when to stop that burn pile and we know we've got biochar and so we don't get ash. The pile should be collapsed all the way down. You should have at least 90% of the charcoal. I should start seeing a little bit of white ash coming in. Sometimes I use mixed woods. So there's going to be some pieces that still are burning, but um, they're not going to have enough time to convert or I'll lose a bunch of the small pieces. So looking at what to separate, what to cool. I'll even pull off some of the bigger pieces sometimes with a rake and then move them to the next pile because we'll have several piles going. And then at that point, once I see that pile has collapsed, most of it has turned white. The, the, um, the fire should be very little, if any, coming up at all. That's the point where I want to cool it down. Um, and that's the part where I hit it with water. All right, fabulous. Okay, so so one more thing about the burn pile before before I move on to holes and trash cans, and that is um, this convert conservation style burn pile. I'm really surprised that we're making biochar with it because, again, I, and I have very limited experience in biochar. When I was reading about it. It was saying that one of the key aspects of making biochar is that you're making it in a limited oxygen environment. And that is why people make it in holes and in um, um, oil drums or, or just other kinds of drums. Because when you pack that space full of wood and then you burn it... Um, there is an interesting biological reaction happening in play because the area is small and and the wood cannot the fire cannot get all of the oxygen it wants to have and so it burns slightly different i um, somebody commented online that that their wood can't get or the fire can't get oxygen drunk right which while i don't know what that means scientifically it sounds really cool um so so so, so what can you tell me about the importance of limiting oxygen when making biochar and why doesn't that really apply to the conservation pile style? You'll make a better char for sure the more oxygen you can limit into it. But the reality is farmers aren't going to use drums. You can't get big farms to dig all these holes and the amount of man hours to process the char and the pits mm. it's really not feasible for a lot of farms so the first conservation burn method i described to you is going to be the crudest way to make char but that's the way a lot of big farms who are already burning anyway polluting the sky can convert piles now if you want to make higher quality char you're then are going to move to the drum technologies where you can get more oxygen absent from the process and not to mention you'll capture a lot more char doing it in oxygen deprived environments than doing conservation burn but the conservation burn is just an open invite for many farmers who are already doing the practice to say hey well let me try this out and typically once they see the results from that char naturally you want to make 
better char in your next run. So that's where the pit and the drums and the kiln technologies start to come into play. But the conservation burn is my my gateway carbon uh, entry point All right. to get farmers to use. Fantastic. Good explanation. All right. So 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 we've gone through the gateway and if we if we've got a bigger farm, you know, we're we're starting to make our piles and we're all like biochar, hell yeah, this is great. Or you're a smaller farmer, right? You're you're a you're a craft hobbyist, you're a home grower, you know, where where we love our cannabis and we want it to be high end and um, I mean, hell, I've got I've got such a small property. It would it would take me a whole summer to put together that much biomass because you know I don't have a big ass farm. So so let's talk about like you know level two of 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 using a uh, a drum. So w- would you describe how to do a drum process? So typically with the drum, we have um, one drum in which your feedstock that you want to make the char with go. You put all your material into one drum with holes in that container, and then that drum typically goes into another drum. And on the outside of, in between the drums, you're going to fill with biomass and different wood materials that then get combusted. And as the fire burns, it draws out the volatile gases from the interior drum, leaving you behind with the um, with pure carbon. Typically, a lot of people use this method. They can get very smoky, but you create very good char this way, but it just takes a super long time. Yeah, and you got to find two different sizes of drums. I mean, yeah. even that sounds like a pain in the ass. All right, so so like let's let's imagine that you have found these two metal drums, one bigger than the other slightly. Um, you said they've got holes drilled in them. Where are we drilling the holes? They're going to put them onto the side, and then down on the bottom so you can get a nice draft coming up from from the bottom of the of the drum. So yeah. so like you know a, ha- a handful of drilled holes in the sides but then a whole bunch at the bottom because the idea is that it's sucking in the oxygen at the bottom. Correct. But you also got to make sure you have enough holes to release the volatile gases as well. So it's to me I think this is probably my least favorite way to make char. Mm. Because of all the complications involved of making sure my holes are the right size. Sometimes they put too many in, but that's the only drum you have. So it just seems like it's, it's, a, it's a tougher learning, um, learning curve with, with that particular style. The pit char would be you know, my second favorite. All to, right, well, let's, let's, let's talk there. about that. Break, break it down. So the pit char, you're going to dig yourself a hole into the ground, and you kind of want to – Cone out the shapes if you uh, on on your on your pit that you make, so you can have an, a little a little edge around the outside of that pit, so air can come in and out of the, the pit. But the trick is when you light that pit, you want to stack your wood above the ground, so you're about a foot and a half above that ground level. And same thing, light at the top. If you light your pit chart at the top, your combustion rate's going to be super quick. But the best part about the char pit is you can, can, once you get the fire up and going and burning, I can keep adding biomass to that pit. And as I'm adding the biomass to the burn pile, it's suffocating the coals underneath. You can create a lot of char pretty quick. It's a beautiful, slow kind of a burn, but you can just keep stacking into the hole as to where conservation burn, you're limited to the pile. You can't keep adding to it. The pit char, you can keep adding biomass and create quite a bit of biomass in a short amount of time, and the quality is just so beautiful. And because you've got so much uh, wood material burning, and the hole is deep, and 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 I guess you'd be limiting the oxygen, right? 100%. So so you've got the wood that's got this slow and steady burn because it's not allowed to get like all out of control because the oxygen is limited. So so there is our advantage to limiting the oxygen is so that we get a, a slow and low long char instead of a, here's a bunch of oxygen and just have it go apeshit and, and then like just burn to ash. <laughs> yeah. 
And that's exactly how they feel too when you're burning those things. The conservation burn is like mad and just roaring. But I mean, and, you know, in a vineyard when they got 20 foot piles where they usually take all day, four, three and four days even sometimes to burn, that aggressive high temperature burn is nice because it's only three hours. Yeah. <laughs> but the pitch are super nice, super slow, good quality. And it's even, once you get the fire nice, I can even throw in a little bit wetter wood because it's just going to combust all within the heat. So I can convert more biomass, you know, that's probably not favorable because of that nice, calm, high heat from all right. So, so, you know, it, scaling up, like making more biochar once you're already kind of sold and successful, um, is easier than probably doing it the very first time when you've got to learn how to do it. So, so if, if, if we are f for this example, let's say that we're, we're just talking about a home cultivator. Let's say that they're just like doing 20 plants or something and, um, they want to produce biochar for the summer um how big and how deep of a hole um is reasonable like you know i i've seen lots of different holes i mean i see some people who are using freaking backhoes for them and then i see, see like nick risden who just spent an afternoon digging a freaking hole that he can stand up in and making biochar in that and not using a big old backhoe so like like give us a little idea of of what this hole is like and, and i'd like you to talk about that ring around the top that you said that helps bring in oxygen because i didn't i didn't follow that okay so, um, man, I got people making the pits as small as like a barbecue pit. Oh. You know, the, the Weber size. So you, people even making it in, practicing in the Weber. They can make small <laughs> piles and uh -huh. then get the skill down and then, you know, get it figured out uh, on a small scale. But it doesn't need to be big at all. They, they can be just the size of a Weber, and that's great for a small cultivator. But what I'm saying about the size – Instead of having the sides of when you dig your hole being straight down into the floor, if you can kind of angle that to the floor so you're kind of at a um, 45 and it opens up. If you look at something called a tiki con kiln, you'll see the shape of the tiki con kiln or what's referred to as the Oregon kiln and how it's kind of vertically shaped. That's the slant size that we need. Um for for that type of burn i understand what you're saying yeah. so so even though we are making these slanted sides we're not filling up these slanted sides with material we're actually no. just still stacking up our biochar kind of as a center column yeah, and and these sides that are at 45 degrees are not filled with wood and that just allows some oxygen to get down into our hole Correct. All right. That's going to be airflow. Yep. Got it. All right. So does this 45 degrees go all the way to our bottom or is it just like, you know, the top third? No, it goes from top to bottom. Okay. So, so, all right. So, so that tells me that like in my head, I was imagining building a pit that's like, you know, up to my neck, right? No. Um, that, that would take a, that would be a big ass hole because, because you'd have to go 45 degrees all the way down to five or six feet of depth. And yeah. that's a really big hole. No, just even think of campfire. And it's actually cool because your family would love if you made a new campfire spot out there. <laughs> it doesn't need to be bigger than campfire size, but just the way you describe how you're going to stack your wood, that's going to be the trick. You don't fill the thing up, but you make that center column style. All right. So and, like a three yeah. by three hole is probably all I need for my whole year, especially, oh, man, especially yep. if I'm going to be adding more material as it's burning. Yeah. You'll all need right. plenty of char. All right, um, this hole and and uh, we've got we we started the fire at the top and um, it's you know it, it's 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 uh, decreasing the amount of oxygen in the in the deeper parts of the hole uh, and yet we're still getting good airflow uh, you know a little bit of airflow from the forty five degree walls and it's clocking along and we're we're throwing in some additional biochar occasionally. Um, uh, are we are we just leaving the top open or are we covering it at all? Um, to extinguish? No, no, while it's burning. Yeah, so the trick is you want to, and it's even referred to as a flame on the cap. You want to make sure you keep a flame on the cap of that pit because if that flame is what's going to do all your conversion. 
And that flame is actually going to keep oxygen out of your carbon as well. So keeping, if you look at flame cap kilns or flame cap pits, you'll see how they maintain it with the, uh, the flame on top. And that's going to be your key. So you may need to add in different size materials at different times of the combustion to maintain that ring all the way around the top, that ring of fire on the top. And that's going to be your converting um, uh, feedstock into into biochar. Why doesn't the flame, that, that, that cap flame, why doesn't it work its way all the way down so that I've got this like total pyre? Uh, as it's releasing gases from the wood and meeting the oxygen, that's our combustion point there. So it doesn't never, the oxygen doesn't make its way down into the carbon for oxidation. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, this it's, is a real badass skill to learn. It's so much fun. <laughs> all right. So, um, all right. So I do want to go back to the, like, while we didn't really dig the drum version, I do want to ask one question that's uh, burning, good pun, um, in my mind. And and that is, you, you said that we've got the two different sizes of drum and we've got, uh, burning material in the center, but we've also got wood material between the two uh, layers of yeah. drum. Um, is the like are are both the interior and are are both sets of wood going to be used as biochar, or is only one of those sets of wood going to become biochar? Good question. Only one, the one in the interior drum on the inside. The outside so what's the stuff, stuff on the, the outside ash. for? That's the that's the heat that's going to then excite the volatile gases from the interior drum and get it to release um, without actually being exposed to the fire. All right, cool. That's good enough. And, and you know, s- since it really does make sense that the vast majority of us are probably either going to dig a hole or do a conservation burn, we're not going to go into the, the uh, drum within drum version anymore. And, and you know, if, if we have excited you know, listeners to like, go find out more. You and I have done our job. Right. Um, but as far as, as far as getting you to teach it, um, I think that people generally understand what the drum version would be like. And if they want to explore that, there's, um, you know, you there's, there's lots of YouTube videos online. All right. So let's talk about, uh, the end process. So, um, it, it's been going for a while. We've got this very successful burn. Um, uh, and, and, um, we have decided it's time to um, put it out because the material is starting, it has, has collapsed and some of the smaller stuff is starting to get a little ashy and we want to put it out. Um, do we just like put water on it? How do we put it out? Yeah. So we're ex- extinguishing with water and keeping a rake handy. You'll have to water down the pile and kind of rake the coals around because they, there's just layers and layers of charcoal under there. And it, the bottom layer will stay hot, even though it appears like it's out. So keeping a rake as you're cooling that char down, it's going to allow that fire to go out and maintain the carbon. But if you don't put that thing out right, you know, you'll come the next day and everything will turn to ash, even though you thought for sure the fire had went out. Oh, you'd be so sad. <laughs> yeah, you have to do it all over again. Oh, so man. lots of water. And all that water gets soaked back into the char too. So it's not like you're wasting any water at all. Right on. The so water, so the yeah. water is definitely, a, you know, you, you can't use too much. Correct. The, the char is very hydrophobic at first. So it's nice to actually give it a nice soaking. That water then is going to start to attract the life forms that you need to charge up that char or get it inhabited. So the cooling part is super important. And so then we just leave it in the hole overnight and we walk away. Or you can pull it out if it's cool, put it in storage containers. Um, But typically people just leave it until the next day. All right. So next day um, we look in our hole, we've got all this biochar. We're we're going like, hell yeah, Quadamuck totally hooked me up. Um, I'm so glad I know this skill. And so like now, now what do we do with it? Um, We'll, we'll talk more in the next set about like, when do we want big pieces and when do we want little pieces? But what I'm more asking you is storage. Like, like what, what do I actually do with that stuff? Do I, do I go stack it? Do I, do I, put it in some kind of a bin like like how do we keep this stuff until we're ready to use it no you can keep that thing in a pile outside um 
near, you know, anywhere near soil and the soils or microbes are going to start being attracted to it. Mm. Um, so I kind of like to leave it out and open like that. It doesn't sound like we have to protect it then. No, no. You want things to come to it. Oh, all right. You know, yeah. So it's usually going to house good things. Um, yeah. So it, it actually is kind of becoming, it's attracting IMO at that point. hundred percent, right? Right on. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay, cool. So let's wrap up this set here. And when we come back, we'll start talking about how to use this stuff. Oh, what a great episode. All right. So we're going to take our second of two short breaks and be right back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. And my guest today is Kawada Magvia. Hell yeah. A fully functioning greenhouse grows extraordinary cannabis flowers that have exceptional bag appeal, great terpene profiles, and exceptional yield. But as we have discussed many times on Shaping Fire, a greenhouse is only as good as the environment you create for the plants inside. Biotherm has been on the forefront of developing and installing highly efficient greenhouse solutions since 1980. Whether new construction, major upgrades, or a retrofit, Biotherm's cultivation climate solutions are tailored to each grower's specifications. They even have root zone heating mats that attach to a home hot water heater for growing areas 500 square feet or smaller. The atmosphere of the growing environment directly affects the health and productivity of your crop. Biotherm offers heating, cooling, dehumidification, and CO2 enrichment to optimize the air your plants breathe and optimize plant growth by enhancing the elements within the cultivation space. Biotherm's dissolved oxygen irrigation solutions will improve the vitality of your water and the efficiency of your hydro delivery system. When you implement Biotherm's systemic innovation, you'll experience increased yields, improved plant vigor, and increased resistance to disease and pests. Biotherm offers free phone and email support for everything they sell and will help you troubleshoot and diagnose issues to get your equipment back online. The explosion of greenhouse cultivation has crowded the field with novice consultants selling unproven gadgets. When you choose Biotherm to regulate your greenhouse environment, you know you're relying on their over 40 years of experience designing, installing, and supporting mission-critical greenhouse technology. Your plants deserve nothing less than Biotherm. Visit BiothermSolutions.com today to learn more and request a quote. One of the challenges with buying autoflower seeds is that often you'll have as many different phenos as you will have seeds in a pack. That can be fun, sure, but so many varieties in one pack is a sign of an immature seed line that hasn't been worked enough. I prefer my autoflowers to be worked enough that each pheno in the pack really captures the aspects that the breeder was intending. This is why I recommend Gnome Automatics to my friends and listeners who grow automatic flowering cannabis seeds. Gnome Automatic seeds are not just crossed and released. They are painstakingly sifted again and again, tested in a wide range of conditions, and taken to a level of maturity that each plant will be recognizable by its traits. Traits that were hard-earned, so that you can have your best growth cycle ever. Gnome Automatics became a trusted and loved brand in cannabis over the last 10 years as Mandalorian Genetics, and recently changed their name to Gnome Automatics. The only thing that has changed is the name. Founder Dan Jimmy continues to pour his passion of breeding cannabis into every variety he releases for you to grow. Check out the Gnome Automatics Instagram at gnome underscore automatics to see the impressive plants folks are growing. You can score Gnome Automatic seeds in feminized or regular at your favorite seed provider listed in the vendor section of their website. Farms interested in bulk seeds of more than a 1,000 should reach out through the website, too. While on the website, be sure to check out the Gnome Automatics shirts and other merch section. If you want reliable seeds, hand-built from effort, expert selection, and experience, choose Gnome Automatics. Once you've discovered the benefits of using cannabis, it's a very small step to start making your own edibles, gummies, lotions, tinctures, and concentrated oils at home. Magical Butter has been helping cannabis consumers become self-sufficient for over a decade. With the easy-to-use Magical Butter Countertop Botanical Extractor, 
you can create high quality cannabis products to your exact specifications at a fraction of the cost of store-bought edibles. I talk a lot on this show about the importance of home growing so you don't have to rely on others to feel healthy. Well, the Magical Butter Machine can empower your personal health by putting you in control of how you use cannabis in your daily life. I've been making my own butters and oils on the stove for years, and I much prefer the ease of using the Magical Butter Machine. I just set it and walk away. With the simple touch of a button, the Magical Butter Machine grinds, heats, stirs, and steeps your herbal extract all at the correct time interval and temperature for the perfect infusion every time. As a result, you achieve your desired infusion easily, safely, and consistently. Check out the Magical Butter Instagram to see the machine in action. And don't feel like you have to go it alone. There is a huge community on Facebook called Magical Butter Users United, sharing recipes and best practices so you can learn at your own pace from others who are already doing it successfully. Now is the time to get your own Magical Butter machine and save money while enjoying cannabis. Use the discount code SHAPINGFIRE, one word, no caps, to get 10% off. Visit MagicalButter.com today. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I am your host, Shango Lose, and my guest today is Quatamak Villa. All right, so here in the third set, we have this beautiful biochar that we have already ma- made during set two, and what are we going to do with it? You know, Quatamak already told us that we don't have to keep it safe. Uh, it's great to lay it out. It's going to start attracting uh, microbes from your neighborhood, which is exactly what we want to do with it, and and now we want to use it. Now, Granted, um, you know, in the audience, there's lots of different sizes of gardens, right? We've got we've got people who are doing huge ass hugel cultures, and then we've got folks who are using huge ass containers, you know, 100, 300 gallons, and then you've got like a bunches of people who are using containers that are like sub 20 gallons, and then 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 you've got people who are you know maybe want to throw some in their house plants too, right? Because like it, this stuff sounds like such magic, I, I'm gonna want to put it in my like simple <laughs> ornamental. Right. So, so let's, 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 let's start at the top. You know, I'm imagining when you're done with, um, with a burn that, that you are seeing these different sizes and you are starting to think about what's going to be used for what. Can you kind of walk us through your thought process when you're looking at this, this pile of various sizes? Yeah. So before I was really anxious to crush it on, make it all the same size. But later on, I started to realize how good it was to have different sizes in my soil. Um, so I kind of leave, I do crush a little bit, but I, I leave it mainly in its raw form. It falls apart pretty good as we handle it. Mm-hmm. So um, <clears throat> let's say that we're doing a hugel. Let's start at the, the biggest size. Um, do you, Are you satisfied just for putting your your big ass pieces your branches or whatever in there or do you want to have a variety of sizes in every growing environment um just based on the size that you're into like like you know small medium small medium and large pieces but scaled to whatever you're growing in yeah hugo mounds are one of those recipients where they can actually take any size and we actually the pieces i mentioned that don't quite burn but you can tell they've been charged just and need more time they're actually some of the best in the hugel mound so for the hugel mounds i find them the most forgiving for all the different sizes it's when we get into the pots and containers where i try to stay towards the smaller um pieces of char Mm. so those those big thick pieces that didn't fully get charged up they they, you know there's they still got hard centers um we should we shouldn't feel bad about that 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 is going to bring its own set of advantages to the party and we certainly shouldn't like ignore it or not include it um it's just going to be helping in a different way yeah it's going to be half hugel and half biochar but Mm -hmm. still contributing to the system and these are the pieces where typically we don't know what to do with them they're not quite char and they're still kind of woody so the mounds just take them and do wonderful things with them. All right, cool. Um, 
when we are putting the biochar into um, assuming that we have dug into the ground a little bit because like I know that some people just make hugel mounds and they don't dig in but but I'm picturing some amount of digging into the ground um what ratio of the biochar do we want to have in that hole you want to go anywhere between 5 and 15%. Depends on how much you have. Okay. So is this a, a, a situation where up to 15% more is better? No. Um, yeah, no, not at all. Um, so so how, how should we decide whether or not we want to do, use 5% or 15%? Like if I have enough to do 15%, should I always do 15% and stop at that? Or are there ever any times where like, no, because I'm using this other thing, I should only use five? No, I'm just mostly char so expensive. People don't have it in abundance like that. All right. Well, let, let's, let's yeah. say that mm-hmm. like you've made your own, right? So you're biochar rich. Um, you know, we would are we would want to use fifteen percent. It sounds like, yeah, fifteen percent allows for like sometimes if you go too much char, there's this weird little adjustment period depending on the kind of char that you have, soil types. I just found like fifteen percent on the max just allows for good soil development and um, not robbing from the host and allows me and like I'm always planting as soon as I use the char some people some people don't do that and especially like hugel mounds you know I think when we use the right biology I always plant in my hugel mounds as soon as we create them and a lot of people they say no you can't do that so these are the kind of things where I found 15% allows me to develop the ecology I need for that first season and, and just keeps me in a, in a good position for food production for that year or medicine. Right on. You know, I've heard that often myself. People say, oh, I I just built this Hugel culture, so we're not going to use it this year. We're going to use it next year. But then I've had like a lot of friends who like build their Hugel culture and they're all like, well, you know, sure, it'll be better next year, but like, let's plant it this year and like get it going and get it primed. And then they grow these like insane plants that are just incredible. And they're all like, oh, see, you know, it's going to be even better last year, but I'm glad I'm glad I used it this year. So, so you you are definitely of uh, on team use your hugel cul- or use your hugel culture with biochar as, like as soon as you make it yeah and that's because of the microbes that i enlist to help me on that if i was relying on the natural breakdown microbes they could lock out a lot of things from my from my garden but since i'm an em bocacci guy and i use a lot of knf stuff i know a lot of the drops i'm doing they're going right in and plus, we got you know foliage uh, treatments at you know in our arsenal. So these things allow for my plant to uptake and for biology to break down without going thermophilic or these other pathways with all of the wood in the in the soil could potentially take it. Right on. That makes a lot of sense. So s- since you are um, an effective farmer using effective <laughs> microorganisms, um, you're, you're actually using a lot of the playbook of our natural farming that helps get your hugel culture up to speed super fast. hundred percent. Right. Right and same concept too, like with char, you're going to read on char where they're like, don't use it raw. But with that same concept, if I'm feeding my char raw, the same way I'm doing my mounds, and those first three, four, five waterings are a nice tea that I know I've been bio or bioavailable for my plant. I don't have to wait for the charging period. It's all being created naturally. And since the EMs are just essentially feeding the IMOs for the area, I'm really drawing them into the char. I could do a lot of things where they tell you, you can't do it with raw char, but because of the partnership with specific microbes and, and the, those goodies, I, you're able to get away with a lot of things. What, I, I don't think I understand what raw char is versus raw, not raw char. So raw char is what they're going to describe. If you just burnt the biomass, you got the honeycomb structure, you cooled it, there's really nobody living in there yet. Mm. So when they say raw char, and I, you, you picture the honeycomb structure as apartment buildings, you got to move in things to those apartment buildings. And once the microorganisms have moved in, they consider that charged char. All right. All right. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So um, what do you find as being best practices for 
uh, charging your char. I can imagine that, you know, earlier we talked about just leaving your biochar out and it'll naturally gather IMO and that's badass. Um, I can imagine that, um, that's, you know, spraying an IMO solution on it that you have prior made that, that sounds like a, probably a pretty reasonable thing. Like what else we got? So molasses is going to attract in the goodies, right? Mm-hmm. Adding a little bit of molasses to your water when you water, and then just straining out compost. Get a bag of compost, mm. make a, a fill it with a sock. You do the tea bag extraction, and getting those goodies from the compost because it's already bioavailable. You're going to know your plants have the goodies that they need, and then all of that's going to move into the honeycomb structure of the char. And we so just want to be- spray it on, right? We don't want to dip the biochar into the compost water or anything because that would... No, this dr- would be would- an application if you were just made biochar and you want to use it like right now and mix with soil. Mm-hmm. That would do, That's what we would call raw. Or if you wanted the top dress with the char, you have your gardens already up and going, but you still want to add char. You can add char to the surface, but then water in with a compost tea and then that will begin to get the char part of the system. I can imagine that if you're going to top dress with a biochar, um, you're going to want to uh, also top that with soil or compost because isn't biochar its most effective when it is kept uh, moist, right? So, so having it on the top where it's wet, dry, wet, dry every day as it gets as it gets watered, um, it's going to be harder for microbes to establish i can imagine and so but if you if you cap it with some compost well then now it's under the compost and it's going to stay moist all the time yeah but evaporation is going to come up through the top so if you are on top it still does get some moisture but scratching that thing right into this on the surface gets it down gets it down into the plain field Mm -hmm. so um keeping that in mind but if you got slugs and things like that that are eating your plants Leaving the bigger chunks on the top and around the plant, they don't like to crawl on oh, that. Scratchy, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very scratchy. So there's times where we'll top dress, but big chunk around the base of the plants to keep crawly things off of them. Man, biochar is like a like a do everything <laughs> member of your garden. Yeah, hundred um, percent. All right, so let's talk about uh, containers now. Um, we have an idea of how much to use at up to fifteen percent, five to fifteen percent in our hoogles. Is, is are those numbers you know about the same for containers, or do we do we need to adapt for some reason? Um, every soil type is going to be different, but typically I'll run between three uh, percent and a 10% for container gardening. Mm -hmm. But I'm also watering during my growing cycle with, like you can take that char that you have and make extracts too with that thing. So you get just the dust particles. So there's a lot of times where it seems like you have less at the initial start, but if you're continually adding in with your drops, your plants are gonna love it, but you're building up the carbon, the electricity um, energy of that soil. So keep it in mind, add it in all, don't, not just a one-time drop, go micronize on that, go top dress on it, but always think about your soil is draining, the plant's growing bigger, the energy is going somewhere, so you're going to have to recharge that, and carbon's going to be that recharger. All right, all right. Now let's talk about really small pots. So let, let's talk about my small ornamentals, like my my flowering plants that I'm not going to smoke on my deck. Right, stuff that's stuff that's there to you know look pretty for me. My dahlias and stuff like that. Um, uh, you know, is it is it the same same kind of thing? Three to three to five percent and five you know, percent typically are good yeah. with the house plant. They don't need. There's not a lot happening. Right. Yeah. You might have like a crazy house plant, but, but you'll get them to flower. Some stuff you do, like you, you haven't seen them throw flower before. They'll flower right up when you when you charm up, and it's like, wow, I didn't even know you made a flower. Well, that that now that sounds like an advantage for us in the Pacific Northwest, right? <laughs> yeah. got, I got a lot of flowering plants that don't like to live here. So, um, all right, so so let's talk about getting them getting the biochar small, and then this micronizing, right? So so you you were very clear with us that it's good to have biochar pieces in a variety of sizes, um, so that it can be host to um, a variety 
variety of types of microbes and you know just play more uh, like a more variety of roles in in the substrate so that's great but let's say that we do want to get it small like uh, maybe we want small pieces to top dress so that we're discouraging slugs or maybe we want to get it small because we want to put a little bit in you know a favorite house plant of ours or or um, you know maybe we want to get it small because we want to put it in the bag with our compost tea um, how do we make biochar smaller <laughs> no fancy technology man we we get a bucket sometimes and just mosh it up in the bucket until we it's can like get with a hammer you know, with a shovel the, the tips oh, of your shovels uh-huh. can break that thing down um, sometimes we'll put it in between um, ply boards four by eight ply boards and then as you drive your machines around the farm you can crush it in between there back and forth <laughs> uh-huh and then i've seen some of my friends their wives don't like it but they'll put it in the driveway and just and drive you, over it for a while yeah drive over <laughs> it and it slowly just crushes through your day-to-day activities and uh, yeah, so there's really no fancy way to. Uh, right, there's no trick to, to it. it. it just, no yeah, trick. I, I get it. A cement mixer. My friend did a cement mixer where he put in trailer hitch balls and let that thing run for a while, and that broke it up kind of nice. So, but right it, it's, so, it's, so it, like yeah. for me, I've got access to lots of uh, burlap coffee bags, right? And uh-huh. so I can see me taking it and putting it in the in in that, and then honestly just kind of hitting it with a hammer, uh, just because like at small scale yeah. that might be what works for me. Beautiful. I love that. All right. All right. So, um, okay. So, oh, micronizing. So like you're describing this micronizing and that's really small. Now, are we as cultivators making it at micronized um, size or are we just putting it in and then nature is breaking it down to micronized? Uh, both. I and mean, as we bang it around, it's it's like glass, right? So every time you move it, it breaks down smaller and smaller, which I advise you to wear a mask when handling the, the char because you're going to breathe it in. But um, nature, too, is going to break it down small. And these are the parts where as you're watering, you're scratching the surface, you're moving things around, the char is going to work its way down into the soil. I kind of Cannabis has such a short life cycle. I have I, I prefer to break it pieces of that down if I'm watering in my compost teas. Um, I definitely love to add the chard with almost all of my drops simply because it's that insurance. When we're out there in the cultivation, doing cultivation, you always are at that point where you want to give the plants all that you can. And I think every farmer can relate to this. It's and I call it the hire me or fire me drops. Where, you know, you, you know, the plants are telling you, give me this, give me that. And you're thinking in my head, like, oh my gosh, we're really pushing you girls. Should I do this? But then when you make the drop and it works out and you know you have the insurance from the char, these are the parts where they're going to hire you. But I've seen people do the same drops without the char and thrash plants. They didn't have the buffer. You get fired. So this allows the insurance for the, um, the cultivator yeah to cover to, cover up your screw-ups and make yeah 100 yeah. <laughs> percent. yeah well, we but love the, that the end result is the plants just they use all that electricity and it just turns into yoga plant yoga plant yoga fabulous so so why don't you why don't you kind of like um bring us home here quadamuk with um you know here at the end of the show um I have heard you speak before and and you have spoken a lot about the interaction, you know, the electricity, the interaction between the biochar and the microbes. And, you know, you are a very um, like systemic thinker, right? You're, you're constantly thinking about the relationships between all the different um, players um, who are in the rhizosphere. And I think that as natural growers, the more and more we're thinking about soil as a you know as a community that we are supporting and less of less as the soil being like this npk eating robot um i i think that we become more allies with the soil instead of you know uh, domination of the soil and um you know we are adding something that sounds like it is um, you know, a very potent um, 
cause of growth. And I would expect that if we take you know, the simple communities, if we haven't been using biochar and we start using it, I can imagine that there will be a new environment in our soil for all of the microbes and for our plant and then eventually us to smoke. Like everybody wins. Will you kind of like speak to this idea of of, of what it means to add this electrically gifted biochar to our soils and 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 what might be experienced by the soil okay so i'm very fascinated with conservation work and ecology and what i find out is places around the world where there's the most macro life the most diversity plant life where there's most diversity living and they look at the soil, it always has a high carbon content. And it's loaded with char. So this tells me that when it happens micro at the micro level, and you can see it at the macro, something must be going on. It becomes a, like nature's playground of life. There's just so many relationships happening I have to ask myself, what role did carbon play in that? And then when I think further back as to even how our whole planet started, you can see where that carbon relationship is hand in hand with water. So we're only here for a short time on this planet, you know? And it seems if there's something we can do to co-create life and foster life, and leave our permanent mark through carbon. That's the real investment. Money comes and goes. But to say that this investment we're making today is gonna be here in a thousand years, how many things can you say that for? And when you take on and have the realization like, dude, I'm making a difference for a thousand years, you stand different, you walk different, you feel like you got a purpose, and it makes it an even playing field. Because all of this, I picked up, which is barely a GED education. I sucked at school. Straight gangster from the streets. But when I learned to work with the plant, and the plant taught me about soil, look how I end up on shows, on your show, talking about things the homies would never believe I picked up on. So not only does it create life on the planet, but it seems like it creates life within yourself. And something about being on this rock especially in these times, right? Mm -hmm. And you feel like, man, I can do some good, especially when we've done so much wrong. I'm grabbing it with both hands. Hell yeah. So I feel like that life force that's even within me, it must transfer over into life around me. And these are the kind of things where people feel like we can do something. We can't wait around for someone to come in and do this work. It's like, this is what we're born to do. All of us in some way is born to co-create, whether we're creating soil or we're creating art. You got to believe it influences each other. And this is going to be the key. It's not a financial thing. It's not a money thing. You can't eat none of that. But the soil and the next thousand years I can affect positively. And even spreading the word, if just one person starts to make char who's listening to this and starts to program nature. And finally starts to realize, wow, I could really do something. Watch what happens to that community. Because if it transforms a little area into so much life, what does it do to an area where things aren't going so well? When you add the carbon and the microbes to an area, watch it change. Pick a spot. Don't tell nobody. Pick a spot, a neighborhood, and start adding this to a spot. Come and visit that spot. Add regularly. Watch what happens to that spot. Birds show up. Butterflies show up. Hell, people with a picnic basket might even end up there who you never saw a picnic there before. Because something happens when you change the soil that somehow changes the macro. And we're part of that macro thing. So I hope that this was able to make you 
feel like you or have already been doing something. So much of your natural farmers, mm -hmm. man, it's like you don't realize what role we're playing here. But I hope this continues to inspire, not just to create, but to share with each other how we're doing these things, to share with the younger generation, because that's the ones who need it the most. Wow. Well, I definitely feel inspired. I feel all juiced up. So um, I don't think we'll, we might as well leave it there. That's beautiful. Quadabuck, I'm, I'm so honored to have you on this show. And, you know, this is our first conversation. I, I uh, appreciate your friendship and I look forward to interacting with you more. And, you know, I guess for now, thank you for being a guest here on Shaping Fire. And, and I look forward to meeting you again in person. Thank you, Shangolos, for having me. Pleasure to talk to you and our first conversation be recorded. I've been a big fan of you for so long. I remember seeing you at Emerald Cup a couple years back and wanted to go to talk to you. You were so busy. So this is great. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, really, yeah. I'm really glad that we had this opportunity today. So thank you. Okay. Uh, blessings, brother. Right on. So uh, if you would like to uh, continue learning more from Kuwata uh, there is only one place to do that. There is one center of that, and that is at his Instagram account. Um, you know, when I was asking Kuwata why or, um, you know, where he wanted me to turn people on to, um, you know, he's all like, oh, just my Instagram. I'm like, well, you know, you got, do you have a, you know, a website or anything? He's like, no, man, I don't have anything to sell. He's all like, I'm just, I'm just here to teach. And that like felt so good because, you know, nothing against the people who come on my show to teach about a topic, but then also, you know, make a living because we all have to make a living, but gotta admit, I gotta admit it. It's, um, it's refreshing to have somebody who has dedicated their life just to, just to education. So with that, um, his fantastic Instagram to follow is book Kashi for you. So um, it's uh, it's B O K A S H I, and then the number four, and then the letter U. So at Bokashi for you, and you can follow along on Quatamuk's uh, education uh, of folks and adventures. And you know you'll you'll have found out about things like the USDA biochar program that we didn't uh, know about. So um, so that's the place you want to go to follow up. You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and wherever you get your podcasts. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you would leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news, exclusive videos, and giveaways. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. Be sure to follow on Instagram for all original content not found on the podcast. That's at Shaping Fire and at Shango Los on Instagram. Be sure to check out the Shaping Fire YouTube channel for exclusive interviews, farm tours, and cannabis lectures. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Los.